Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath worship, period. Sabbath worship here at Path for the Peace Ministries. I pray that you're blessed as we worship God in spirit and in truth. But at this time, we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the word. We thank you, Lord, for the truth. We thank you, Lord, for the time that we have together. And we ask you, Lord, that you will be with us, that you guide us and direct us. And we know there are many who had prayer requests, and we pray for them in a very special way. We pray for those who are sick, that they get healed. Pray for those who <clears throat> need a closer walk with you, and there are those who are having financial issues. We pray that you will help them with that. But you pray at this time. We praise your name for this time of worship. We praise your name for the Sabbath. We thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath, a time to of restoration. And we ask you, Lord, that you be with us as we worship you today and use us for the glory of God. We pray in Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. Well, at this time, we're going to sing our Sabbath song. I didn't forget. <laughs> Somebody said he forgot the Sabbath song. I don't forget the Sabbath song. So let's go ahead and sing the Sabbath song right now. And then after our Sabbath song, we'll have our hymn. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy six days shall thy labor and do all thy work but the seventh day the sabbath of the lord thy god in it thou should not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger, that's within thy gaze. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in the midst and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Well, at this time, we're going to have our first hymn of the day. Praise that you're blessed by it. Sing along with us as we sing the hymn to the glory of God. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now time for our client to have any question in prayer. And if you have any prayer requests at this time, you can give your prayer request. I know uh, many people have been praying for various things, and so we will lift them up in prayer today. And uh, we thank God for his many blessings upon us. Um, we are very thankful for uh, it's a beautiful day outside. It's not as cold after this week. It was colder here in our area, but today is a nice, uh, a nice warmer day for us, and we're thankful for that as well. So, bless Happy Sabbath Day. So, um, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this privilege of being in your service. We ask you, Lord, to continue to be with us throughout the service today. May you be glorified. May your truth continue to go forward with power. May you prepare us and may we be used to prepare others for your soon coming everlasting kingdom. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. At this time, we'll have our health talk by Carlene. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, today, um, let's start off our health talk with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. And please bless this health talk and please continue to teach us of your helpful living. In Jesus' name, amen. So guess what is it? What are we about to talk about today? Continuing in our health tip series what is it okay they are pulses they are little round flat seeds they belong to the legume family god told ezekiel to make bread with it and esau sold his birthright for it yeah you got it <laughs> i spilt the beans uh it is lentils. You're right. That was a big hint when it said lent. He saw sold his birthright to it. Lentils. We're going to talk about lentils. Yep, you're right. Lentils. There's different colors of lentils. There's red lentils, regular lentils, and different lentils. But we're going to talk about lentils. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Um, but uh, you see the different lint tools on the screen? Got different ones. What are some of the nutrients in lint tools? Well, lint tools contain fiber, B vitamins, protein, folic, magnesium, and iron. Now, what are some of the health benefits? Whoa, there's a big list of them. Lowers cholesterol. Imagine if there's a pill like beans. <laughs> and what are the side effects? Well, they're benefits. <laughs> Reduces the risk of heart disease. Good for digestion. Lowers blood pressure. Improves Blood flow, good for diabetics. Balance sugar levels and is a slow burn energy. Increases energy, prevents osteoclerosis, fights against cancer, neutralizes free radicals, prevents cell damage, active against DNA damage. Now, lentils, you can do different things with it. You can make a soup. You can boil lentils. And you can sprout them. And you can sprout them and make bread with them too. <laughs> so that's it for today's health talk. And that's it. <laughs>
Today's scripture reading is in Zechariah 9 9, and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Israel, Jerusalem, behold, the king cometh unto thee, he is just, having salvation, lonely, and riding upon an ass, and upon a cotton of a fat fodal. Of an ass. Go ahead and have our Bible story. 
And I hope you have your evidence book that's available as well, because uh, it will really help out in understanding the different time that is mentioned here as well. Um, let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this privilege to come together and continue to study. Um, we pray that you give us understanding and continue to teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, well, today we are talking about the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, as you know, because we're in the Daniel series, was the king of Babylon. And his empire was vast, and he was um, one of the greatest kings in known in history. And so today, we're going to look at the beginning of his reign all the way to the end of his reign. So it's looking at the, the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar's life, because there's some lessons that we can learn as we look at his reign. And so if you will take a look at our slide here, um, because what we're going to do is what we're going to chronicleize what the Bible actually says and gives about his reign and then line it up with history. And I think it'll give you a better picture of King Nebuchadnezzar than um, you may have understood before as you see how God tried to save him and how it relates to how God works to save us. Because not only does God try to save kings, but he tries to save every person on the planet. Okay, so let's begin our st uh, story today. The reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. And I got this picture of Nebuchadnezzar. In history, he is known as Nebuchadnezzar II. So in history, uh, he is known as Nebuchadnezzar II. Okay. Um, this is what the Bible says about the first year of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 1 through 11. It says, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of, G of Babylon. So this is the beginning of the reign. Now, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the crown prince for uh, the, as the king of Babylon prior to um, his actual taking his soul reign after his father died. And that's revealed in history as well. Um, but this was the first year of the soul reign for Nebuchadnezzar as the king of Babylon. Um, the which Jeremiah the prophet spake unto all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even unto this day, that is the three and 20th year, the word of the Lord hath come unto me, and I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking. But ye have not hearkened, and the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But what? Ye have not hearkened. They weren't listening nor incline your ear to hear. They said, turn ye again now every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. This is your land. Repent so you can continue to dwell in it. And go, this continuing in verse six, and go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me to not to anger with the works of your hands. And I will do you no hurt. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to do your own works. Hurt. Thus, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. 
the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So that's the 70 year prophecy that is mentioned there in Jeremiah chapter 29. And here, that was the first year of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, right? So here, the Bible mentions the second year of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter two, verse one, it says, and in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. And many of you are familiar with the dream. We've been talking about it as we've been going through the Daniel series. And that is the dream where he had the statue of gold, uh, with uh, the statue that resembled a man, the head of gold. In fact, let's read it here in Daniel chapter two, verses 31 through 38, where uh, Daniel gave the interpretation of the dream. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before thee and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth this is the dream and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king thou o king art a king of kings for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Now, putting this in perspective of the timeline of the story, and that's why it's so important to understand the timeline, when Nebuchadnezzar became the sole prince or the, uh, the crown. He went from crown prince to being the sole ruler over Babylon. His kingdom was not big at that time. This was actually a prophecy for Nebuchadnezzar. He was not the king of kings over the entire region at that time. So when Daniel gives this prophecy through the interpretation of the dream, when he says, thou art this head of gold, it was a big deal because he had not achieved the height of what we understand later in the history of King Nebuchadnezzar. This is only at the second year of his reign. And there was a lot that occurred and a lot that actually made him wealthy occurred, as you will see, is uh, in the captivity of Judah, the gold that came from that region. Um, let's continue. That's the second year of the reign of King, King Nebuchadnezzar. And when King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, it was a prophecy because Babylon at that time was beginning its growth according to the prophecy given by Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied that it wasn't just Jerusalem that was going to be taken. Other nations in that realm would be taken as well. And afterwards, Daniel chapter three, in defiance to uh, this prophecy that his uh, his kingdom would last forever, uh, the golden image, he built the whole thing of gold. That just shows you kind of like what his character was like. He's like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to have those changes in the kingdoms. He built it all of gold. But then King Nebuchadnezzar saw the three Hebrew young men come from the fiery furnace unharmed. And he recognized the hand of the son of God. Daniel chapter three, verses 24 and 25 says, then Nebuchadnezzar, the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. And he answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. And then, of course, he calls the young men out of the fiery furnace. So that's 
continuing now. So we've looked at several years of his reign, but now let's skip forward to the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Second Kings chapter 25, verses eight and 10. It says, and in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is what year of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar? The 19th year of his reign uh, of King, King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, came Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, a servant of the King of Babylon into Jerusalem. And he burnt the house of the Lord um, and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt he with fire. And all the army of the Chaldees that were with the captain of the guard break down the walls of Jerusalem round about. So that was in the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And if you have the evidence book, you will see that what that that occurred in 586 BC. It's not just in the evidence book, but recently archaeologists found the evidence of the burnt cedar and um, that was found in that region when they were excavating something actually for something totally unrelated. And they were able to pinpoint when that actually occurred. And that was in 586 BC, pinpoint accuracy, they said in the article. Um, so the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar as King of Babylon was in 586 BC. And that is when the destruction of Jerusalem occurred and he carried away even more of the gold and um, the items as well from, uh, from Jerusalem. After that time, because we see in history, something else happened because we're looking at BC date. So that was in 586 BC. And now here in 575 BC, which would have corresponded to a later time in the reign of, of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. This was something that he did. Uh, he built the Ishtar Gate. The Ishtar Gate was constructed by the Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar II in what year? 575. So it was approximately nine years later that he actually builds this Ishtar Gate. It was the eighth gate of the city of Babylon, and which is in present-day Iraq, and it was the main entrance into the city. The Ishtar Gate was part of Nebuchadnezzar's plan to beautify his empire's capital during the first half of the 6th century BCE. He also restored the Temple of Murdoch and built the renowned wonder, the Hanging Gardens, as part of this plan. The, the Ishtar Gate was so well known that it made the initial list of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So this was a big deal. Here's some more information on the Ishtar Gate. It says King Nebuchadnezzar the, uh, II, he reigned from 604 to 562 BC, the peak of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. He's known as the biblical conqueror who captured Jerusalem, and he ordered the construction of the gate and dedicated it to the Babylonian goddess Ishtar. Sounds like Easter, and actually the two represent, that's where Easter gets its name. The gate was constructed, Ishtar, which is a goddess, by the way. The gate was constructed using glazed brick with alternating rows of bas relief or dragons and bulls and lions symbolizing the gods Murdoch, Adad, and Ishtar respectively. So you see Ishtar is one of their gods. They had a multitude of gods. You talk about pantheism, which is the worship of many gods. I mean, they were worshipers of many gods. And King Nebuchadnezzar was a worshiper of many gods. For him, when it was that he um, said that God was a God of gods, he was looking at it in terms of, okay, he's a God of many gods. That's pantheism. But King Nebuchadnezzar, as he went on, learned to be a worshiper of the one true God of heaven, not the worshiper of multiple gods. Because this happened, again, um, as you continue in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, you see this is where he was at when he built the Ishtar Gate in, again, the year is 575 BC. Okay, so it said the roof and doors of the gate were made of cedar, and um, the, the bricks in the gate were covered in a blue glaze meant to represent lapis lazuli, a blue, deep blue, semi-precious stone that was revered in antiquity due to its vibrancy. And the blue glaze bricks would give the facade a a jewel-like shine, so it would really shine. 
and through the gate ran the procession away, which was lined with walls showing about 120 lions. And there's a picture of like the dragons and things that were actually inlaid on this gate. Um, bulls, dragons, flowers on yellow and blaze, black glazed bricks symbolizing the goddess Ishtar. And the gate itself depicted only gods and goddesses. And so that is the information on the um, on the Ishtar gate that again occurred later. Now, all of this is the backdrop for Daniel chapter four, where King Nebuchadnezzar gives his testimony about how the God of heaven transformed his life, because it was after this time that the events that he writes in Daniel chapter four occurred. Um, in fact, hold on a moment. Let me see if I have it here. Here's a picture of Ishtar Gate. Um, and this is actually at the museum in Berlin. Um, and this is what it looks like, the blue. Um, let's see, this was restored to kind of look like what it did during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. I'll give you another one. And this is what happened afterwards. Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar has a nut, has that dream. And Daniel gives him the interpretation of the dream of what's going to happen. Because at this time, everything that was prophesied, and this is why this is so important to understand the timeline of events. Remember, Jeremiah prophesied what would happen and how he would take over and conquer that entire region, right? Now it's fulfilled. He has the whole land and the prophecy has been fulfilled. Now King Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. And this time the dream is, oops, this time the dream is regarding uh, what would happen um, as the, to him as a tree. And I know that Pastor Rogers is going to be talking about that today, but I just kind of wanted to give the backdrop. Um, if you look at the territory of what Babylon was able to conquer, you see that vast territory, you see how God fulfilled it. And you see here in Daniel chapter four, how Daniel was trying to counsel King Nebuchadnezzar to take heed to what the God of heaven was trying to tell him in terms of, you know, humility. Um, but after that time, at, God gave let me go back here. One more moment here. He gave Nebuchadnezzar his, um, his kingdom back. And in Nebuchadnezzar chapter um, here, in information about Nebuchadnezzar, this is just found in history, um, a summary of, of his reign here. Nebuchadnezzar, um, Nebuchadnezzar II, which is what he's known in history, um, he, it says he was the second Neo-Babylonian emperor ruling from the death of his father, Nabu-Pelazar, in 605 BC to his own death in 562 BC. And he was historically known as Nebuchadnezzar the Great. He's typically regarded as the empire's greatest king. Nebuchadnezzar remains famous for his military campaigns in the Levant, for his construction projects in his capital, Babylon, including the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, and for the role he plays in Jewish history. Ruling for 43 years, Nebuchadnezzar was the longest reigning king of the Babylonian dynasty. Not just the Babylonian dynasty. Kings didn't re re really reign that long back then. I mean, a 43-year reign uh, was a big deal. And by the time he actually died, because his reign ended in 562, he was around 80 years old. That's pretty old for any king, um, but the king of Babylon, that was a big deal. Perhaps, and this is just the thought I thought of, he took heed to some of the wisdom that Daniel had about, you know, diet and, you know, uh, what was he, what did Daniel eat? Pulse, like the lentils that Carlene spoke about earlier. Um, perhaps he took heed to some of those things and he had a better diet than most of the Babylonians. But anyway, he ruled for 43 years. He was the longest reigning king of the Babylonian dynasty. By the time of his death, he was one, he was among the most powerful rulers in the world. And so it's so amazing how God 
through what he did in Daniel chapter four, which is a testimony that he wrote himself and put in a decree. And all the book of Daniel was, was took what King Nebuchadnezzar himself said and put it in the, in, in what he had in that section in the Bible, because it was his testimony of how God transformed his life to a, from a worshiper of many gods to the worshiper of the God of heaven. Um, he was possibly named after his grandfather of the same name or after Nebuchadnezzar I, one of the Babylon's greatest ancient warrior kings. Nebuchadnezzar II already secured renown for himself during his father's reign because he, he was the crown prince, like I mentioned earlier, during his father's reign. And he led out the armies in the Medo-Babylonian conquest of the Assyrian Empire because that's who they took over uh, at the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC. Nebuchadnezzar inflicted a crushing defeat on Egyptian army led by Pharaoh Necho II and ensured that the Neo-Babylonian Empire would succeed the Neo-Assyrian Empire as the dominant power in the ancient Near East. And shortly after this victory, Nabopolassar, that's Nebuchadnezzar's father, died and Nebuchadnezzar became the king, the sole ruler. And so it was a long uh, reign from 605 BC all the way to 562 BC, a 43 year reign there. Um, and what was so amazing after the testimony that's written in Daniel chapter four, and it was really exciting because God did so much to, um, to heal uh, King Nebuchadnezzar a man who was filled once with so much pride, you couldn't tell him anything, basically. He tried to say, you know, I'm the one, I'm the only one that's going to rule forever and ever my kingdom. He recognized the God of heaven. And it was such a big deal when his life was transformed and he was healed that after his death, something else happened that's mentioned in the Bible the same year that he died. And we'll take a look at this. Second, Second Kings chapter 25. Um, verse 27 and 28, it says, and it came to pass in the seven and 30th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month on the seventh and 20th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in, in the year that he began to reign. So why would evil Merodach, which is Nebuchadnezzar's son, begin to reign in that year? Because what had to happen to Nebuchadnezzar? That's the year Nebuchadnezzar died. So the year that his son, Evil Murdoch, began to reign, and he was the next king of Babylon, this is what Evil Merodach did. Evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, did lift up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, out of prison. And he spake how? Was he rough? No, he spake kindly to him. And what did he do? And set his throne above the kings that were with him in Babylon. Isn't that amazing? It was such a testimony how God healed and restored Babylon that it was a witness to the world. And his son, who was the ruler after him, was so impressed by this that it, in humility, he took the king of Jerusalem and released him out of prison and put him on the throne uh, at in Babylon as well. Because that year, the seven and 30th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim corresponds with the 43rd year of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, which is when he died and his son, Evil Merodach, began to reign. And if you want more information on that, go to the evidence book because God has all of those dates because it links the Bible with history and it's all right there corresponding with the 43rd year of the reign of evil Merodach when Nebuchadnezzar died and ended his reign. And so impressed by the events of his father, King Nebuchadnezzar, that when he began to reign, he released Jehoiakim from prison, sat him up on the throne in Babylon. God's word is true. That's the message that we see from the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. And the honest in heart will recognize the power of God. And Nebuchadnezzar, even though he was known as the king of kings because the prophecy was fulfilled and he has the Ishtar gate, he has the hanging gardens, it's a renown to the world. This rich ruler humbled himself to the God of heaven and in humility, he worshiped the one who made the heavens 
the earth and the sea. If you go to the book of Revelation when, in the three angels message, that's who we are to worship. The God who made the heavens, the earth and the sea. And it's my prayer that like King Nebuchadnezzar, God is reaching out to the hearts of the world and everyone will have the opportunity to make a decision to humble themselves to God's divine authority or to continue in rebellion. And it's my prayer that when you recognize the awesome power of God in humility, you too will worship him. Amen. Let's close out with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you have done. And we pray, Lord, that you continue to um, teach us as we continue to go through the book of Daniel chapter 4 during the Sermon of the Hour by Pastor Rogers. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to enlighten us and to um, touch our hearts, Lord, because all you want to do is to save all of us more than anything or anyone or, you know, anything this world has to offer. The most important thing is our salvation, eternal salvation. We want to be a part of that everlasting kingdom that you set up. And we pray, Lord, that um, that you will work in us to do your will for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we will have our hymn of meditation before the sermon of the hour. I'm going to uh, do the hymn. It's hymn 529. It's entitled Under His Wings. Under His Wings. Under His Wings. Hymn 529. Under his wings I am safely abiding Though the night deepens and tempest are wild, still I can trust him. I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me, and I am his child. Under his wings, under his wings, from his love, love can Under his wings, my soul love safely abide forever under his wings what a refuge in sorrow how the heart yearning returns to its rest. Often when earth has no for my healing, there I find comfort 
and there I am blessed under his wings. Under his wings. Who from his love can sever under his wings? My soul shall abide safely abide forever under his wings oh what precious enjoyment there will I hide till life's trials are over. Sheltered, protected, can't harm me. Resting in Jesus, I'm safe. Ever under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can save under Praise the Lord. I pray that you've been blessed thus far from the uh, service. But we're going to go right into prayer at this time. And we're continuing our book of Daniel Last Day Prophecies. And today's study is the testimony of King Nebuchadnezzar. As was mentioned just earlier, he was a very powerful man, powerful man. But God humbled him, and we're going to learn about that today. But let us pray. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you. We're grateful, Lord, for the blessings that you have given us on this Sabbath day. And we praise your name for the Sabbath, time of restoration, time of rest. And we ask you, Lord, to give us understanding of the word as we continue to study the word today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So we're concluding our study on two evil twins of death. And the two evil twins of death is pride and idolatry. 
And that's what we studied last week. But today we're going to be looking at the testimony of King Nebuchadnezzar. The true remnant people of God must allow him to remove all pride and all forms of idol worship out of their lives. We go to Romans, Romans 12, 3, Romans 12, 3. It says, for I say through the grace given unto me that every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think soberly, according to, according as God have dealt to every man the measure of faith. So we can't go around all puffed up about yourself. Or oh, I'll make a little, you know, I'm very wealthy, I'm rich, and you know, I'm puffed up about it. You know, one thing is, even if you are wealthy, you shouldn't flaunt it. Amen. And that's what the world does. They get wealth and then they get jewelry and things of that nature. And they drive a very ext extremely expensive car and you're just putting it out there. You know, like then thieves be thinking like, man, I think I can take that. <laughs> That's why they walk around with book bags and stuff. So they ready to get some of that jewelry that a lot of people have. But anyway, but don't think that you're greater than what you are. And that's what the Bible is saying here. Don't, don't, don't say, well, you know, I'm great. I'm just, <clears throat> ain't nobody like me, you know? <laughs> and the Bible says we should be sober. We should be humble before God. James 4, 6. But he giveth me, giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humbles. So God said, I don't, I, 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 I don't like the proud because I am the one that created. I am the one that died for humanity so they can be saved. So as the Bible says, we are nothing without God. And we must walk in humility just as Jesus walked. Amen. Let's go because the pride, the, the world, that's mainly what they puff up. They puff up pride. They they think they are uh better than everybody everybody else. But not only that, I, it just came up to me. You know, it's just amazing how Satan use, uses words um like pride to describe the LGBT community. They call it pride. Doesn't they call it pride? They call it pride. And then they call it love. It ain't love, it's lust. And it's not according to the word of God. And there's one thing is when they bring it into the church, because the world's going to do what they're going to do. And, um, and they're going to puff up the LGBT and they're going to have their big parades and they're going to say pride and this and that. But it's a whole other thing when the church allows the LGBT to operate as leaders within the church. That was one thing the LGBT or somebody who was gay and they come into the church and they, you know, they need to learn the truth. But it's a whole nother thing when that L an LGBT person is leading out music, worship music, and other forms of worship and other things. But um, now we're going to go ahead and learn about a king who had pride and idol worship. And he had, he's going to give his testimony in Daniel chapter 4 of how God helped him get rid of pride problem and truly convert in the likeness of the character of God. Now, this is a big deal. Daniel, Daniel, who was a testimony for Jesus Christ or for God, the Messiah, right there, he had a high position because he was faithful. But 
Nebuchadnezzar had the most powerful position in the world. And God converted him. And let's talk about King Nebuchadnezzar's conversion. Because all before that, he said, you know, I'm this, I'm that. I'm the one that built this place. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. But we're going to go ahead and read this and, and learn more about. He didn't say blah, 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 blah. I just said it because, you know, there's a lot involved. Okay, so we understand that. But let's go ahead and go to Daniel 4. Uh, one through three, Daniel four, one through three. And we're going to look at the truth, how he's converted to the truth, truly converted to the truth. Nebuchadnezzar, the king unto all people, nations and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace and be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show you the signs and wonders that the high God have wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. He sounds just like an apostle, doesn't he? A disciple or one who was like Paul who was truly converted. And that's exactly what he sounds like. But let's go ahead and continue. Because we find that King Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. And we remember he had the dream in Daniel chapter 2. But here in Daniel chapter 4, he has another dream. And in Daniel chapter 4, 4, 4 through 17, we're not going to read it, but we're just going to give you a summary of it. He describes another dream he had and he... He just didn't remember the context of the dream. He didn't know the meaning of the dream. He didn't understand what it was referring to. So he called the same people that could not interpret or tell him the dream in Daniel chapter two. He did the same thing. Like they're going to like, <laughs> like they're going to be able to uh, give him the understanding of the dream, but he calls them. He calls his sorcerers and musicians and soothsayers and say, yo, here's the dream. I'm telling you the dream. Now give me the interpretation. But of course, they couldn't do it. Now this time they get the dream. They could have tried to make something up, but they couldn't do it. Why couldn't they do it? Because God did not allow them to do it. Who's in control? God is in control. So even when the most powerful king in the world, God wanted to meet, reach his soul. And so he went to the one who was faithful to God, the God of heaven, the one that showed him a dream and the interpretation in Daniel chapter two about that goat, about the image that shows a rise and falls of kingdoms. And he was that head of gold, talking about Babylon. But God revealed that there would be another kingdom, the Medes Persian kingdom. And then after that, Babylon. After that, Greece. And then after that, Rome. And then the feet divided Europe. So what did he see? He saw a large tree in the midst of the earth that was a great height and reached the heavens. It was full of leaves and fruit. And many birds and animals loved that tree. They came to that tree. People found shelter under that tree. They ate food from the tree. Then what did King Nebuchadnezzar hear and see in the dream? Let's look at Daniel 4, 13 through 15. Daniel 4, 13 through 15. And I saw in visions upon my head and my bed, and behold, a watcher and the Holy One came down from heaven. So you can imagine a watcher coming down from heaven. 
And the only one I know that will come down from heaven is an angel. In verse four, and he cried aloud and said, thus, hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit, let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. This was as just like a person with tree service. When a person with a tree service comes, they cut the branches, they cut the trunk down, boom, but it's going to leave a stump. And then they can actually take a, a, a stump grinder and stump it on down. But it's just interesting because from time to time, somebody would ask, you know, I got this tree up there. Would you go cut it down? And then we'd say, well, no, because that's not our business. That's not what we do. But they're trying to get a free cut. I said, no, that's not what we do. We don't we don't cut trees down. But we do cut trees around here and uh, of that nature. And it's a... Uh, you can't just cut a tree. Just you can't just go in this and whack it down. You got to know what you're doing, because there are many people who died as a result of cutting the tree down because they were not understanding of what was going on. They just cut it, and then that tree uh, did jumped up and knocked the person over, and they're dead. But anyway, that was just a side note. But anyway. Uh, but that's something that's done on a regular basis, especially if you've got some property or especially that's your business. But this is interesting because it's one thing that a person who cuts a tree down would not do one thing, but what God revealed in this dream, this is very interesting. Verse 15, nevertheless, leave the stump of the roots uh, in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass. Now, it's just interesting. It depends what kind of tree it is, because there are some trees that will have like saplings or whatever. They, they produce saplings. Or they can actually, I know, like, uh, give me a tree. Uh, maple tree, maybe. What? No, not a pine tree, an oak tree, or if I left a stump there, if I left a stump there, it'll grow back something back. What's that? A magnolia. That's good. Magnolia, sweet gum. So there are trees hard, that if you cut down, hardwoods, that's what I'm told. If you cut down, it will grow. Even though you have a stump there, it will start to grow another um another tree so let's continue to study though so in verse 15 nevertheless he left the stump of his roots of the earth and even a band notice again with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beast of in the grass of the earth. And I can I can almost bear to tell you. There is no leader that I know in my modern time that went through what Nebuchadnezzar went through. It just I can just imagine, you know, President Biden just uh, you know <laughs> having a testimony like this. But let's look at the interpretation. First of all, what is a band of iron and brass? Now, was it a ring of iron and brass wrapped around the stump? For many years when I studied this, that's what I thought. But look it up. You got to go deeper. So what is band? And the cow D means imprisonment. So, okay, that's something. <laughs> A prison to the house inmates or an enclosure to protect the city from intruders were made of brass and gates and arms and bars. 
Just like an example, the brass of gates and arms and bars, you find Isaiah 45, 2, I will go before thee and make the crooked place straight. I will break into pieces the gates the, of brass and cut to sunder the bars of arms. Sorry, yeah, put that on the screen. I, I didn't get all that. So ban imprisonment. Okay, a prison to the house of inmates, et cetera. Enclosure to protect the city. Uh, and we just read Isaiah 45, 2. But that's what it is. It's, they had some, obviously, they had some way not to put a ban around that stump. And I'm just wondering, and I just just something I'm thinking about in that vision. That when, because it was a vision, wasn't reality, was a vision that pointed to reality. And in that vision, it's, say, it's saying, "You're gonna lock up the stump." <laughs> that would sound like gonna lock up the stump. But who represented the tree? Come on now. Nebuchadnezzar represented that tree. <laughs> and it's like God's about to God's about to lock him up. And that's exactly I mean that's what it sounds look like to me. It looks like it's behind uh prison walls. Anyway. The stump in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream was enclosed like a prisoner surrounded by iron bars with a locked brass gate. Now, let's continue. Let's go to Daniel 4, 16 and 17. And this is Daniel. Notice Daniel, very high position given to him in the king's court. The king had actually saw the three Hebrew boys plus Jesus himself in the fiery furnace. And so he experienced a lot when it came to God of heaven. But he still was filled with pride and God was about to do something drastic. So let's continue. Let his heart be changed from man's and let his let it a beast's heart be given unto him. Let seven times pass over him. So here in verse 16, we see that he's going to take him from, because heart, when it's referring to man, is referring to what? The mind, right? The emotions and the mind. <laughs> you know, when you say he has heart, you know, he's, He's centered. He's focused. That's what it's talking about. And you know, the heart is the what? The center of the of your your um circulatory system. I'm talking about the fix six, the actual heart. But you see, in the mind, it is the central focus of your thinking. Now, because you can't think with your hands, I can't think with my feet, I can't think, I can't think with my literal heart. I can't, you know. So is a is a is a word to express the reality. So he's his mind is changed from the mind of a human being to the mind of a beast, the mind of animal. And when you look at animals, animals operate on, uh, operate on, uh, what's the word I want to use? Operate on instinction. That's it. That's what they do, what God has placed in them. And you've seen beasts, you've seen <laughs> uh, dogs or Around here, we don't have lions. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. And it, it, I, I, you know, I don't know how they do it in other countries where they got lions and bear. We got bears. We do got bears, but not here. They may go 
from the Piedmont to the mountains. So you may see one every now and then, but not like out. You know, they're they kind of hidden and they do what they got to do. But a lion. But look at this. This is a situation which you never actually see. Where he is given right then and there, you'll find out he's going to give in a mind of a beast and seven times pass over him. And we'll talk about that, what that means in a little bit. But this matter is by the decree of the watchers and demand by the word of the holy ones. Now, understand when a decree is given by God, could that watcher representing an angel probably uh, directed by God? When it is given, what's that telling you? It's going to happen as revealed or the lesson revealed or what's going to happen in reality from the symbolism to reality. And he said, and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high God ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whosoever whomsoever he will and sitteth up over it the basis of men so again he's going to go from a human mind human thinking to a beast that don't sound like reality that don't sound that can happen what was Daniel's reaction when he heard the dream now, remember, you're talking about, in the human sense, the most powerful man on the earth. So it's something you can't take lightly, even as a prophet. And then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for one hour. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine, he's get, he gets a vision from God, and he's like, oh, for one whole hour, he is. Oh, Do I tell him? I mean, what can I say? Ugh. And his thoughts troubled him. And the king spake and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thy enemies. I'm not your enemy. I don't hate you. But this is from God himself. And whoo, I can imagine Daniel had to pray about it. Lord, do you really want me to tell him these things? I mean, he I, I can I can understand, you know, a person kind of go crazy, but you you take it from he's gonna have a human mind, and then he's gonna be his mind's gonna be like a beast. Now, how do you tell somebody that? The most powerful man in the world. But God said, you got to do it. So what was the interpretation of the dream that troubled Daniel so much? Because again, King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he's like, uh, what's going on with you, Daniel? I'm praying. Let's go to verse 20 to 26. The tree that's Thou sauce. Okay, Lord, give me give me the strength. That's what I can imagine him saying as he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar. The tree that I saw which grew was strong, is whose heights reached into the heaven, and the sight thereof, and to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in the midst of the meat was meat for all. Well, meat meaning food, okay? Food. And what grows on trees? Burgers? <laughs> no, we're talking about fruits and veggies. It was meat for all. Under the beasts of the field dwelt upon its branches. The fowls of the heaven had their habitation. Beautiful tree. Wonderful tree. And I don't know what kind of tree it was. Could have been an oak tree. 
could have been a cypress tree. It could have been, you know, these the trees that they had in a region. But it was a unique tree because it had various fruits for the people. And it was great shade. So it was obviously a big tree. And then he said in verse 22, what did he say? It is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong for thy greatness is grown and reached into the heaven and, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Now, if you left it there, what do you think uh, Nebuchadnezzar would have been like? Oh, that's I kind of like that dream. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's that's good. That's just like he did when he built that image. He was thinking, hey, just like he saw in the dream that he was ahead of gold. He said, no, I'm going to go ahead and build a whole image that I saw of gold from head to toe. And we knew about that happening with that. Because now he's like, now Daniel said, okay, that's not the end. So there's a lot more. And you need to listen. It's serious. Very serious. Verse 23, and whereas the king which I saw a watcher and a, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Are you ready for this? Hew down the tree, cut it, and destroy it. Yet, leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even a band of iron and brass, meaning that's imprisonment in the midst of bars and a gate of iron round about it, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let its portion be with a beast of a field till seven times pass over him. Let this be the interpretation, O king, and let this be a decree of the Most High, which come upon my Lord the king. Now here's the real deal. This is what it all means. This is the reality of the symbolism that's given. Hope you're ready for this. And I can imagine the king was probably just have a seat. Could have been standing up. Have a seat. Listen. Verse 25. They shall drive thee from man. And thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over thee. And in the Chaldean, the literal is means a literal year, seven years. In other words, and I'm just going to say it in the way its interpretation is, seven years shall pass over thee. So in other words, what's going to happen to King Nebuchadnezzar is going to happen for how long? Seven years. Why God choose seven? Why did God choose seven? Because it means completion. The task is done. Seven years shall pass over thee till thou know the most high God ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee after that thou shalt have known that heaven rules. In other words, what is God saying? You're going to see. I'm in charge. Not you. I'm in charge. I made the heavens, the earth, and the sea, everything in it, and I am in charge. You could be the most powerful king, but I can bring you to the lowest point. That's what I was saying. But why am I doing this? To save you. To save you. Because if he didn't do what 
we about to even talk about more, it would have been he wouldn't have made it. So after Daniel appeals to King, so because in other words, he said, You're gonna be can you imagine that? I mean, come on now. Human beings don't we don't normally go down and start going to the grass and start eating grass, you know. <laughs> oh, you, you can imagine how that so in order to eat grass, listen, order for him to eat grass. See, God has made us the only, uh, I don't want to use his word because we're made in the image of God, but compared to the animal kingdom that he made, we stand up. You may have some animals who are able to stand up temporarily, like a gorilla or something like that. But for the most part, compared to all the animals, we are not an animal. We're made in the image of God. And we stand up, which takes a lot of ingenuity and the intelligence of God to actually have us stand. Because it's not really an easy task. When you have uh, gra gravity pulling against you. But I can imagine that he went to his all four. He went to his hands and his knees. Because it's kind of hard to eat grass when you're standing up so just like an animal now he has an animal mind so he does things just with instinct he ain't thinking he's been totally humble to the point where he gets on his knees and his hands and start to eat grass like an oxen Verse 27, wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee. And what's the main point in him giving this dream? It's the same main point that God has for us. Did he do it just for entertainment? Did he do it for uh, just to do it? What was God trying to do? Save his soul. So what's he say next? Break off thy sins by righteousness and thy iniquity by showing mercy to the poor. And if it may be a lifting up, a, a lifting of thy tranquility. What do you got to do? What's the main thing? You got to be converted. You got to turn from your evil ways and turn to the God of heaven. You've seen the testimony of the God of heaven. You've seen the truth. So the time has come. But God wants to save your soul. What was Jesus' appeal to us today? What does Jesus say? He says, harden not your hearts. Hebrews 3, 12 through 15. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any among you an evil heart of unbelief. In departing from the living God, but extort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitful deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end while it is said today. When? Did it say tomorrow? Today, if we hear his voice. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. So what was the king's response to such a... Uh, mm. Daniel 4, 28 to 30. It just seemed like this is, this is, whoo, this is something else that you're telling me. Uh, so all this came unto the king Nebuchadnezzar and at the end of the 12 months listen 
Did King Nebuchadnezzar understand what was supposed to happen? But notice in the dream, in the vision, God never told him when it's going to happen. Did you get it? Did you miss it? God told you it's going to happen. And I can imagine Nebuchadnezzar, that's one year went by, nothing happened. <laughs> I ain't, I ain't going to be eating two years go by. No, I just say I say it this way. One month goes by. It does tell us exactly when it happened after the dream. It does tell us exactly. Yeah, but he wouldn't know exactly within the 12 months when it happened. So retract what I just said about that. It says it because right here, verse 29. At the end of the 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon I can imagine one month go by, two months, three months, four months, five months, six months. He said, ain't got nothing going to happen. I don't know why Daniel tell me that. I can respect him, but, you know, seven months, eight months, almost a whole year. And then verse 30, the king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the by the power of my power, or by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty. So is it exactly at the end of the 12 months. He's puffed up. I don't even think he thought the, the vision was going to happen. Immediately. After he said these words of how he did this, he did that. What was God's response? Daniel 4, 31 through 33, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying unto King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. I can imagine he just, did you hear that, man? Did you hear that? <laughs> Something like, no. The kingdom is departed from thee. And I can imagine him saying, who is that? Did I hear what I just hear? No, I don't hear nothing. You just hearing voices? I'm hearing a voice. And it said the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee grass as an oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee. We know that seven years. And that, and until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whosoever he will. The same hour was a thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. The same hour the thing was fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from man, did eat grass as an oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like the eagle's feathers and his nails like the bird's claw. Only thing I was just looking and reviewing, I mean, at that time when he's given the vision, he don't know, he didn't know exactly. We're given in the Bible, yeah, 12 months later, but after he receives a vision, he does not know exactly. He, you know, he probably didn't think it was going to happen. 
But you didn't know exactly okay, it was going to be two months, six months, two years, three years. You didn't know exactly. But 12 months later, we see him go. <laughs> oh, wow. He, he, he did. If somebody did that today, you say, oh, man, they just, they got mental illness. <laughs> I mean, that's what they will say. Cause he did his mind his he had the, one of the worst mental illnesses ever because his mind god changed it from a man to a beast and he's out there <laughs> it was so bad like what's up with king nebuchadnezzar man he's out there let me tell you something he's out there eating grass <laughs> see there's some he's out there eating grass man you doing what yeah man he's eating grass and he's like a beast. He's doing you know, like a beast. He's like he lost his mind. He didn't even say anything, you know. He's, he's, he's just crazy. Oh, and the people out there, oh no, what what do we do? Man, don't tell people. Don't tell them. <laughs> keep it back there. Don't tell them. We just keep a watch on them. We keep the kingdom going, but uh, don't tell. So one year goes by, he's still messed up. Two years. And you can imagine this people that worked with him, worked for him, didn't know. Even the princess, they just they thought that was that was it. He was done. So what are the results of the pride? The Bible says, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction, the Holy Spirit. Before the a fall, Proverbs 18, 12, before destruction, the heart of man is hard and before honor is humility. And what are results of pride? Isaiah 2, 11, the lofty lips of a man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And that's what was God was doing to Nebuchadnezzar. He was humbling his heart. Verse 12, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty and every one that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. How is spiritual Babylon described in Revelation 18 and what will happen to Babylon for those who are in it? Verse 7, how much she have glorified herself. And lived deliciously in so much torment and gave her and sorrow give her. For she said in her heart, I said, a queen. This is Babylon now, you know, the spiritual Babylon. I am a queen. I'm set as a queen and have no widow. I see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. When God says it, it's going to happen. And what is a warning to those in Babylon now? Revelation 18, 1 and 2. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven. Having great power on the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong, strong voice saying, Babylon, the greatest fall in its fall in it, and has become a habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So this message has gone around the world. But Babylon's full of pride, confusion, mixing truth in the air. But what does Jesus say in verse four? And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not her plagues. So what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? Now, remember, it's Nebuchadnezzar giving the story, giving the testimony. So, so, so Nebuchadnezzar, tell me, what's the conclusion of your testimony? I mean, you trying to tell me that's how it all happened? That's how you become a servant of God? He had to make you like he, he, he like a beast? So he you could he's like, yes. So he could humble my 
humble my spirit. And Daniel 4, 34 to 37. And at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes into heaven. So how many days was that after? Or years after seven years. As God said, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes into heaven and my understanding returned unto me. What's that saying? God took his mind from that beast to a human being again. And he, I can imagine he's saying, what? Wow. And I blessed the most high. And I praised and honored him. And that liveth forever. Whose dominion is the everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He said, I'm nothing. But before he's like, king. It's like you know, I'm nothing. I'm going to tell you my testimony. I'm nothing. I'm just like you. And God wants to save you. And he doth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what dost thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me for the glory of my kingdom and my honor and the brightness returned unto me and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me and I was established in my kingdom and the excellent majesty was added unto me. Who's in control? God's in control. Seven years I can imagine all those who are part of the king's court. They was just, they, they, they just like, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to make it, man. Man's out there crazy. <laughs> he's crazy. He's crazy. But then you can imagine him say, what? <laughs> Who's that? Man, you won't believe it. It's the actual one. King and Nebuchadnezzar. And then Nebuchadnezzar comes in. Praise the God of heaven. And they're like, what? He's back. Praise him. Honor his name. He's humbled me. As you can see, he humbled me. And this is a real story. This is nothing made up. It's in the Bible. So I, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven and whose works are truth and his ways are judgment and those that walk in pride, he's able to abase. So do you think he walked around with puffed up pride again? No, he learned a lesson. Took him seven years to learn. He learned it. And he had no problem sharing it and that's the interesting thing no problem sharing God's truth and who God is so what keeps some people from making a full surrender to God Bible truth pride and that's the reason why he didn't surrender all the other years but he saw the testimony of Daniel saw what happened with the three Hebrew boys. They're not burning. They're thrown in there. He still wasn't converted. But now God converted him. So in order to make a full surrender to God, we must remove, let God remove pride and give us the gift of humility. Amen. We learn this. I what's the word I want to use? This extreme, because <laughs> that's what it is. Extreme lesson and testimony from King Nebuchadnezzar. And I don't know. I know my wife likes to look at history, study it. I don't know what they have in the history, you know, the actual historical record. Because there was a time when he did not reign. So I'm sure that's in a historical record, that time that he was not reigning because he was crazy. And uh, and I don't know if they got details on that. But anyway, let us pray. And Father Lord, we thank you. We praise your holy name. 
for the lessons you taught us today. And we lessons about King Nebuchadnezzar. And you let him know and see and through providence and the and the uh vision you gave Daniel and the dream you gave Nebuchadnezzar, you humble Nebuchadnezzar. And you brought him back to his kingdom because he has truly humbled and recognized and realized that you are in charge, not him. So we are grateful, Lord, for the lessons. And may we be humble and walk before you. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Be with us the rest of the Sabbath day. Bless us and keep us. We pray for those that travel. We pray for the tithe and the offering that's given to your work in these last days. Bless us and keep us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen.